जय भीम जय मुल्यवासी और एंड वेलकम यू वंस अगेन टू एमएनटी न्यूज़ नेटवर्क स्पेशल टाइम सेशन ऑन संडे एज यू ऑल ऑफ नो दैट फॉर द लास्ट होल वीक वी आर सेलिब्रेटिंग बुद्ध पूर्णिमा एज अ रिवॉल्यूशनरी आइडियोलॉजिकल पर्सपेक्टिव अवेकनिंग एंड एवरी डे वी आर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग वेरियस सेशंस रिलेटेड टू बुद्ध एंड हिज आइडियाज हिज आइडियोलॉजी इन ऑन डिफरेंट एस्पेक्ट्स डिफरेंट टॉपिक्स डिफरेंट एरियाज and today is the concluding of this uh, particular uh, session we for which we are organizing for the last 7 days and today we are concluding it with uh, 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 the southern part of india and the revival of buddhism how it was revived in buddhism and who played a key role uh, in uh, or in getting this uh, revival of buddhism in southern india and uh, uh, today we have uh, eminent specialist uh, 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 on this particular topic who is continuously doing research and uh, who is continuously uh, having his uh, uh, hold on uh, buddhism uh, overall today we have uh, dhammachari uh, ajit vasu sir with us uh, jai bhim jai mulya vasu sir welcome jai bhim jai mulya mulya vasu namo buddhaye namo buddhaye sir uh, welcome to mnt news network and uh, thank you very much for uh, sparing your valuable time uh, on uh, today's uh, the special session and as uh, i told that uh, this is the concluding session of uh, the whole week uh, uh, which we are organizing this uh, particular uh, buddha purnima uh, on the ideological basis uh, buddha and his ideology on various aspects and how uh, we should take it uh, his ideas his ideology uh, into uh, into our day to day life and how we can improve ourselves and how the humanity can be established in today's uh, entire scenario and uh, definitely buddha had played ideological great role uh, uh, in uh, getting in uh, knowing the humanity uh, to a common man in a very scientific and a very broad perspective uh, so basically uh, for the whole last week we were uh, 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 organizing various uh, topics related to uh, buddhism and today also uh, one of the topic uh, we are uh, we had organized for our viewers and specifically today's uh, topic of discussion is uh, the southern part of india and how because normally uh, the maharashtra and the uh, uh, na- northern mm-hmm. part uh, they, uh, most of the people are aware of some of the ideological development of buddhism but southern part uh, uh, to that extent people are not aware so it is yeah. uh, uh, our uh, fortunate that today we are uh, we had organized this session particularly related to how this buddhism was revived in southern part of india and uh, what were the roles played by various uh, people various uh, uh, buddhist people uh, in reviving this buddhism in the southern part uh, that we would like to hear from you uh, on this particular aspect please elaborate more and uh, make a wake on our uh, viewers on this particular topic sir. okay thank you thank you very much from uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, to the mntt mnt network for taking such a very uh, important pertinent topic uh, regarding the revival of buddhism happened in the southern part of india uh, as we all know during the time of uh, buddha buddha himself had been to sri lanka for three times that is what mahavamsa says and uh, during ashoka's time ashoka had sent uh, his children uh, mahendra and sangamita to uh, uh sri lanka for spreading the buddhism and uh, it was available in most of the uh, parts of the world which were under the control of ashoka at that time but as we all know by the end of the mauryan empire uh, that support was gone and uh, it it was deteriorating in many of the places but still there were there were uh, buddhism which were handled uh, which were handed over from teacher to pupil traditions in many part of the world and uh, during the uh, trade uh, through the through the sea uh, even the western countries also had some taste of uh, buddhism at that time but over a period of time it has uh, deteriorated as you all know in india it disappeared uh, completely the 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 sankha was also completely uh, destroyed and the viharas were all uh, taken into some other beliefs like uh, hinduism and all those beliefs have taken over uh, the viharas in the, and converted to temples and in in uh, sri lanka it was still surviving till that time but 
during the colonialization of the british of the of the european colonization uh, even the sri lanka has also faced some setbacks in the case of buddhism buddhist uh, monks were uh, ill treated uh, some of them were killed and uh, there were so many uh, hardships they faced to propagate and uh, uh, sustain buddhism in, in the soil of sri lanka so when you consider the south india i'm considering the sri lanka also as the whole area because during ashoka's time even sri lanka was also a friendly country and uh, we were all considering it as a single country almost like the, like it's a single country so when you when you see how it was revived in the modern times uh, we come across four major names the stalwarts you can say the stalwarts the very 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 dedicated committed personalities who came to rescue buddhism and revive buddhism in south india and uh, the four most important names are uh, colonel henry steel alcott who was by birth a uh, european origin but he was an american and he born in 1832 and uh, he his contributions were also being used by the other people like the who was coming uh, after him like it was all like cumulative effort like one person starts something the other person also benefits and then multiplies that effect so it was all these four people had uh, uh, in some way they they uh, they uh, worked together not maybe all time personally but they worked in a cumulative manner so that all it, it created a very synergic effect in the revival of buddhism the second person was pandit ayyotidas he was basically focusing in indian soil especially from tamil nadu and uh, two days back his uh, birth anniversary was there he he born in 1845 may 20th so uh, he was uh, one of the ra- most radical uh, personalities in the field of uh, revival of buddhism then professor uh, lakshmi narasu uh, he was also in from tamil nadu and uh, he did lot of researches and uh, wonderful scientific presentations about buddhism and wrote a lot of uh, very very uh, authentic books about buddhism and uh, uh, anagariga dhammapala he was from uh, from sri lanka and his contributions were very immense so we will just briefly look into the contributions of all these four people in a in a quick glance uh this uh, uh first of all we will start in the, in the same order of their chronological order Hen- colonel henry steel alcott he was american citizen and he born in new jersey and he was from an european origin but he was the first person who embraced the buddhism in america who is a, who is having a european background as we all know when british had colonized all these parts of the world like india sri lanka and all these places uh they they were there were since they were having some knowledge about india which is a place of a lot of philosophical thoughts schools of philosophies were there so they were interested what is going on in indian soil so they so a lot of uh, white people uh, you, you call them orientalists they came to india and they create they they set up a, a, a research center to study about the various schools of indian thoughts uh, like uh, buddhism jainism uh, even brahmanism and all those things they studied and they 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 set up a thing called asiatic society and asiatic society had its uh, head office in calcutta and uh, they tra- trans they they translated lot of uh, they collected and they translated lot of uh, uh, works into english and that created lot of curiosity in the soil of uh, west especially in uh, europe and america and this is such a uh, such a situation where colonel henry silk alcott also got a curiosity about 
East, what is going on in India? Because he had some inclinations towards spirituality from his uh, younger days, when his uh, college days itself, he had some interest in spirituality. So he, while uh, while uh, living in Ohio, his he became a spiritual correspondent in New York Times, and he was also a lawyer. They were all all these four people were highly qualified, and they were all uh, intellectuals. And uh, Olcott, he uh, even uh, worked as a lawyer and he assisted uh, Abraham Lincoln's assassin, I mean, uh, assisted in the, in the investigation of Abraham Lincoln's uh, assassination also. And he, in 1874, he met uh, Helena Blavatsky. We called, called her as Madame Blavatsky. And they, they co-founded uh, uh, a Theosophical Society in New York. This Theosophical Society was basically aimed at studying Indian uh, philosophies. And later they, they decided to bring the Theosophical Society's headquarters into India, in Adaya, Tamil Nadu. Because they wanted to learn it in a more purest form, rather than uh, taking, a, uh, taking an opinion from some other third party authors. They wanted to directly experience and learn the schools of philosophies in, in, uh, in India. So they set up the office in Adaya, uh, Chennai. I mean, right now it is Chennai, near Chennai. And uh, they started learning various schools of uh, of Indian thoughts. And he was, he became more fascinated to Buddhism because it was more scientific. It was more scientific according to his, uh, his views. And he got more interest and he went to uh, Colombo in 1880 and he met uh, along with uh, Madame Blavatsky and he met uh, uh, a monk called Sri uh, Piratna Tissa Mahanayaka Teru and uh, he took five precepts and formally embraced Buddhism. As we all know at that time in Sri Lanka the colonial forces were trying to spread Christianity and sub trying to suppress Buddhism and he felt very bad about it and he wanted to stop that and he wanted to raise voice against that and he wanted to uh, present Buddhism in this very in a more scientific method which is more appealing towards the Western hemisphere. So he wrote uh, he, he, he presented he tried to present these uh, concepts of Buddhism, the basic fundamental principles of Buddhism, its 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 background, who was Buddha, and what was his message, all these things, trying to present, he tried to present it in a more scientific manner, because till that time, almost everything was in a very mystic or a very uh, religiously uh, presented, like a, like a religion. This is the first time he instead of showing it like a religion. He wanted, he wanted to show it like a way of like how it has to be uh, understood in a scientific way. So he created, he, he made one very beautiful uh, uh, book. He wrote a very beautiful book or a, or a uh, set of uh, uh, information. He compiled everything called Buddhist Catechism. It is somewhat similar to the Christian Catechism. So he wanted to create all the basic tenets, all the uh, frequently asked questions or the normal doubts or any all those things which can appeal the uh, western audience so he created the uh, uh, buddhist catechism and it was basically in a kind of a question answer format so that created a lot of appealing in the in the in the west especially in uh, america and europe and people started uh, taking buddhism more seriously and started studying Buddhism more seriously, and he, with his this this approach, he started uh, working more, acting more favorably for Buddhism and trying to stop the imposition of Christianity in in Sri Lanka. So that was a kind of a uh, of an awakening for the Buddhist culture in Sri Lanka, because it was it was a second life for uh, uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka. And he created a lot of educational institutions, around 300 plus uh, educational institutions. 
and uh, some of them were uh, i can just name them like an ananda college dhammaraja uh, dhammaraja college uh, malya deva college and uh, siddhartha kumara mahavidyalaya and uh, so many other mahinda college nalanda college colombo and thammagash thammashoka college in uh, ambalagonda it's all in sri lanka so there are many schools and college education institutions which were highlighting buddhist thoughts and buddhist philosophy and uh, dhamma basically and uh, since he has acted against the christian christian um, colonial christian dominance uh, he is considered as a revivalist of buddhism in sri lanka and he took a very major role to bring the culture back to uh, buddhism and it it also helped uh, the struggle for independence against the colonialization it also mobilized the people tried to mobilize the people on a buddhist cultural background buddhist nationalism and it mobilized the people to act, i mean act against the colonialization and work for the freedom struggle of uh, sri lanka and he even uh, tried to there was a there was a um, world parliament of religions happened in chicago in 1893 as we all know we are we might have heard about uh, swami vivekananda had his speech in uh, chicago that is the same par- uh, religious parliament and he uh, colonel henry alcott he financed the buddhist delegation who was going to the uh, world religion parliament and he uh, he you can say that now buddhism is considered as a third biggest religion in the world in 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 the case of the population or the support so i think he played a very crucial role very key role uh, in bringing uh, bringing buddhism to such a such a magnitude and uh, and later on whoever has associated with him also benefited from the ground work he has done and uh, he has uh, uh, made the made the background for the rest of the people who were coming after him and almost uh, almost at the same time not too too late uh, there was parallelly there was another uh, movement or another move was happening in tamil nadu that was you know uh, led by a person called pandit eoti das eoti das sir so eoti das was he born in madras and he settled in uh, nilgiris like the present uti near to uti so he was a tamil anti caste activist he was more radical he was he was he was uh, he was basically a siddha practice siddha medicine practitioner siddha medicine is a natural medicine of tamil nadu and he was a siddha practitioner but at the same time he was a anti caste activist and he he had a very radical idea that the parayas the the um, the present scheduled caste scheduled caste people of tamil nadu the major caste in um, uh, tamil nadu parayas they are or they were originally buddhist and buddhism was their original religion he was always arguing he was always propagating this idea to the masses see this is your religion buddhism is your religion hinduism is not your religion and you are originally buddhist and you have to go back to buddhism this was a message he was always com- communicating or conveying between the uh, masses there and uh, he was also telling these masses that it was this is your land and this land was grabbed by the aryans so this is the kind of radical approach uh, pandit yoti das was having and he he founded many organizations and he founded uh, he, uh, many newspapers for the upliftment of these people and educating them to buddhism he founded the panchamvar mahajana sabha panchamvar means the fifth caste and he always insisted that you are not part of this hinduism you are a casteless people the parayas of tamil nadu you are a casteless people and you should always take keep that status in your mind that you are a casteless you are out of the caste fold you are panchamas 
you are you are not in the part of that four varnas you are outside this caste pole and you are free you are buddhist this was the message he was giving and he when he when he founded this panchamal mahajana sabha he was assist, along with the uh, rattamalai srinivasan you know rattamalai srinivasan was actively uh, uh, colleague or a, or a co supporting hand for uh, baba saheb ambedkar even in the round table conferences and yodidas also organized the uh, other tribals of the nilgiris like the uti that hill area and uh, he he collected them to become a major force and he wanted them to convert to buddhism and he also started a magazine called uh, dravida pandya dravida means the dravidian pandyan is the uh, that king that king the the previous king of tamil nadu so dravida pandyan was one magazine and he was writing so many articles about the consolidation of the people over there and converting them to buddhism and he also made a, another magazine called one paisa tamilian it is in tamil nadu it, tamil it says that oru paisa tamilian it's one paisa tamil it was a very 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 cheap everybody can afford that particular newspaper and he made the people as the reporters into that because every people they 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 could give the uh, 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 reports they could give uh, articles everything to that particular newspaper so it was a kind of uh, inclusive uh, medium for people and there were a lot of discussions uh and articles about buddhism and uh he 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 can he can say that he is one of the key personalities who inspired the present dravida kalagam you know the dmk you know this dravida munetta kalagam or uh, anna dmk is uh, anna dravida munetta kalagam so that dravidian movement dravida munnetta munnetta means the advancing or the the progress of dravidians that movement was actually got an inspiration from pandita yotidas and uh, later on tande periyar periyar ivi ramaswami and ambedkar also highly benefited from this kind of inspiration uh, started by uh, pandita yotidas so his contribution had inspired a lot of people and he also inspired the sri lankan uh, people also like henry steel alcott worked in sri lanka yotidadar yotidadas uh, worked in uh, tamil nadu and there they had connection with one common person called anagarika dhammapala anagarika dhammapala got inspiration from both these people henry alcott and pandita yotidas that i will come uh, later so he and and one more thing pandita yotidas has done is uh, he created he, he established one uh, movement called shakya buddhist society an organization called shakya buddhist society and it is in in english it was called uh, uh indian south indian buddhist association so it was it was having its uh, headquarters in madras and it had its branches all over uh, south india and it is it was later on known as indian buddhist association so this was his major uh, contribution for the uh, buddhist revival in tamil nadu basically and tamil nadu not only tamil nadu the south as a whole and almost at the same time a contemporary called uh, p lakshmi narasu kokala lakshmi narasu he was a scientist basically he was a physicist he was a professor in physics very highly educated person and he see us like uh, baba saheb and einstein were saying if somebody is having a scientist scientific outlook or a scientific background they will definitely go towards buddhism they will definitely uh, uh, will be inclined towards buddhism because that is the one thing which speaks about the nature the natural laws 
how the nature is working how the natural laws are working and how it is working inside you how your mind and body is working how emotions are being developed how your mind can be managed all these things if you are having a very proper strong scientific uh, uh, acumen or a scientific thought naturally you will get inclined towards buddhism because other other religions are all uh, you know based based on certain imaginary concepts which are not really real so this here in, in buddhism there is nothing which is uh, against the reality in, in fact buddhism teaches us to uh, know uh, and experience the reality so lakshmi narasu was a scholar and an author and a social a social reformer and a buddhist philosopher he he along with pandit yogyotidasar and uh, uh, there is one other person called m singara velu who who was the founder of uh, indian communist party father of indian communist party later on they created this in shakya buddhist society which i said earlier so these three people were there in that formation of shakya buddhist society to make uh, buddhism more popular and uh, they almost at that time anagarik dhammapala had created the mahabodhi society and these people also collaborated with uh, uh, that mahabodhi society also and uh, he conducted professor lakshmi narasu conducted various conferences seminars and classes all over tamil nadu all over tamil nadu and he made one very famous book it is still regard it's, it's a small book but it is regarded as one of the gems in uh, understanding the key concepts of buddhism and all the philosophical angles of buddhism are perfectly uh, explained in that book i'm having that book here i can just show you this is called the essence of buddhism this is a very famous book and uh, this book it's a second edition first edition he created second edition was uh was done by it was it was uh, done by anagarika dhammapala and the third edition was uh, done by baba sahab ambedkar they they wrote he, he wrote the preface also and he even recommended this book baba sahab had recommended this book essence of buddhism to the, to our masses they should read that book so this was uh, his uh, uh contribution especially there were so many other books but this was one of regard as the was the best book even baba sahab recommended that book means it is not a small book and uh, this book has been translated into hindi by bande uh, anand kaushalyaya uh, and it is uh, uh, also it, it was original written in english and it is also available in tamil so it is available in many of the major languages so if everybody is getting a, anybody is getting a chance they should read this book i think the pdf is also available somewhere in the internet so this he also created an intellectual uh, foundation for buddhism in south india and the the last but the foremost name is anagarika dhammapala anagarika dhammapala is uh, he was he was uh, uh, born into a very rich merchant family he's uh, that time since the colonialization was there uh, his faith the family had a christian kind of a faith and his name was originally when he was born his name was given as uh, don david heva vitarana so david heva vitarana but he had an association with the henry alcott when he went to uh, sri lanka and started working for the upliftment of buddhism he associated tanagarika dhammapala associated with uh, henry alcott at that time he is not anagarika dhammapala he was just don david heva vitarana and he uh, uh, associated him, him uh, associated with uh, henry alcott as a translator to translate all these buddhist uh, books and the concepts to english in that association he uh, and madam blavatsky was also there and she suggested him to learn the pali and uh, know more about buddhism 
and luckily we got uh, uh, this uh, Mr. Heva Vitarana started learning Pali, started learning Buddhism and he became an ardent Buddhist and he changed his name to Anagariga Tamapal. Anagariga means homeless, a person who is, I mean, he, he, uh, he, he decided to become, live as a homeless person. And Tamapala means one who is, uh, you know, uh, 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 he is a Tamma, Tamma ko palin karne wala, like he is uh, uh, protecting the Tamma. So he changed his name like that. And he uh, took eight precepts. And eight precepts were uh, normally being taken by the uh, monks or people who are into more serious uh, life, uh, monk life. So that time, he himself, he voluntarily took these eight precepts and he started because he wanted to become, uh, devote, devote his entire life to Buddhism. And that, that way, he went all over the, he traveled all over the uh, uh, world, especially to Europe, North America, and uh, even India also. He wanted to popularize Buddhism and he didn't take monkhood at that time because when he, in his travel, sometimes that monkhood will become a hindrance to his freedom to move around for, for everything. So he conveniently kept it for a, kept it pending and he was going around and you know, as, as I explained earlier, there was a world religion of, world parliament of religions and Anagarika Dhammapala was the main speaker for Buddhism. And Henry Olcott sponsored him to participate in the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago. And Anagarika Dhammapala made wonderful presentations about Buddhism. And Buddhism became a favorite philosophy for the West also. So even today, those intellectually inclined people, they are all mostly preferring Buddhism than all the other other uh, religions and uh, he's one of the major 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 achievement is that when he went to uh, uh, Gaya, both Gaya because he he got a uh, news that Edwin Arnold was there in uh, both Gaya who wrote uh, the, the major major I mean the famous book called the light of Asia so when he knew about Edwin Arnold visited Bodh Gaya. Uh, Anagarika Dhammapala had a desire to go to Bodh Gaya, visit all the places of Buddha. And he noticed that the Bodh Gaya, the Mahabodhi temple, the Vihara, was actually under the control of Shaivite Brahmin priests. And he got shocked. And he started an agitation. And he filed a lawsuit against that. Because that is... Or that is a property of Buddhists and it should be maintained by the Buddhists. So he gave the, uh, I mean, he started with the lawsuit, but but it, it the, the decision came posthumously, like after the independence of India, that uh, he also got the control, Buddhists also got the control on the Mahabodhi system. And the, he worked for the renovation of that Mahabodhi temple. It was actually in a very you know, dilapidated condition and it, is, it became, it was got renovated. And uh, he also went to Kushinagara, Kushinagar, where Buddha had his uh, last breath. And uh, there also he, he, he tried to uh, renovate the, uh, the Saranath, the, the, the Vihara of the Saranath. And he was also instrumental in doing that. And uh, the Mahabodhi society, even though it was started in Colombo, it was moved into Calcutta after that because he knew that the whole that area that northeast belt and the U up bihar that area which was the fertile soil of buddhism he wanted the mahabodhi society to be started in calcutta and it was he moved it from colombo to calcutta and soon so many other uh, branches were started all over all over india even in bangalore also we have uh, mahabodhi societies uh, vihara so, the restoration of the Mahabodhi temple at Bodh Gaya is one of the very, very important achievements of uh, Anagriya Dhammapala. 
and uh, one another thing is that he he was the west was always having a having a image about buddhism that it is a kind of a pessimistic image because in in buddhism we we talk about you know let go like you don't want many many things to you know uh, strain your mind you have to leave whatever the attachments but it is actually a pessimistic way or how to manage your mind without stress and worries but when in a materialistic world people think that the accumulation of materials will be the way of happiness but in fact they are getting more and more strained people doesn't know about the real uh, meaning of that one. but when he explained the concepts properly the concepts were all properly scientifically uh, presented to the western countries they got the real taste of buddhism oh this is not pessimistic but it is highly optimistic like how a person can live without worries that is what is the main uh, objective of the life and how that can be achieved so he presented it in a very uh, positive manner and in 1933 he died as a monk when he, he was a monk and uh, his name became devamitta dhammapala anadrika dhammapala became devamitta dhammapala and he died in 1933 and he is considered as a bodhisattva in sri lanka he is considered as a, he, was, he was one of the main uh, main personalities who revived the buddhism in sri lanka so as we know all these people did their part and it it benefited the people who came after them and it became all became a cumulative synergic effect and uh, even edwin arnold started the first book light of asia even the theosoph the, the asiatic society as we know ashoka ashoka pillar the thamma lipi everything was deciphered by uh, the the orientalist james prince who deciphered that particular uh, lipi that script and uh, we came to know about the inscriptions of ashoka which was all written on the uh, on the stones uh, stupas and we we from there it it again benefited to other people our edwin arnold came up with the uh, the light of asia book then henry alcott came with uh, his uh, buddhist catechism and he presented the positive uh, the scientific view of buddhism and then that benefited anagarika dhammapala that benefited p lakshmi narasu and pandita ayodhidas also so all these things became a cumulative effect so this is how uh, and finally all these things benefited baba saheb also and uh, what we are also benefited from all these people like baba saheb also gave us the whole uh, uh, rest of the uh, you know energy uh, and uh, awakening of buddhism in india and uh, we are also fortunate for these people who did a lot of commendable work dedicated work before us and left a very uh, remarkable permanent mark in the history of uh, south indian buddhism right sir. so our future people our future generation the young the present generation and the future generation should read and understand about the contributions of all these great people how they all contributed towards uh, our present buddhist india yeah right sir rightly pointed out sir basically uh, this uh, my voice is equal is equal yeah yeah okay. so basically, so basically uh, whatever this uh, whatever contribution, whatever is, uh, contribution uh, we had we had it like echo was there yeah hello yeah ha ah, yeah see that is equal so these uh, uh, really the contributions of all these uh, uh, forefathers and all these uh, frontiers is really contributed and, uh, and uh, we would like to know uh, your uh, message to present generation of the viewers uh, what you would like to say uh, in current scenario whatever work they had done see as we all see from the all these four people they learned understood and presented buddhism in a scientific manner 
rather than as a conventional religious point of view so that is the basic difference from difference of buddhism from the other religions this is just learning understanding how as a human being how your mind and body is working you have to learn because uh, as we all know people are now thinking in terms of religion caste race and and because of these things lot of hatred lot of uh, 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 riots and and the whole india is now in a condition where everybody is hating the second person everybody is looked upon with hate see the that is basically because of the ignorance how as a person how you are working what is your mind what is your body how it is interconnected how emotions are coming it is nothing to do with any heavenly force any 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 ishwara or any god or anything it is your mind is doing all this mischief so you have to learn this one so first of all you have to understand the key concepts and how to observe you and study you that is the eightfold path the ashtanga marga the ashtanga marga every and as far as i i i am concerned i have a feeling that this knowledge should be included in a, as a basic curriculum in every every educational system whether it is abroad or in india or any part of the world a basic knowledge about how as a human being how your mind and body is working because this is the the mind and body is the only tool or the the whole body is the tool for you to work for the entire life that is your that is your uh, 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 vehicle to lead this whole life so at least you should understand how it is working that is a basic knowledge if you get that knowledge many of these false imaginary concepts of god caste creed race uh you me all these separations fight ego all these things will disappear because that is a you see as a human being you should know about yourself when you buy any buy you any equipment you get a manual along with that manual is for how to how to use this equipment properly how to use it what are what are the wrong ways you should not do it what are the right ways you should do use it similarly for a human being you have this body and the mind to live the whole life and you should know how it is functioning how it is working that is a basic knowledge everybody should have and that should be included in a in a, in a curriculum and if that is given all these concepts about you me me as a separate self you as a separate self all these illusions will go the the false ideas about this god the your god my god then your religion my religion your race my race all these things will vanish and people will start understanding oh i am also going to die and i am also having everything going to be mortal and uh, he is also and he, every every other animal every object is also part of like me every we are all connected together and that kind of a compassionate view will come people will start to start living in a more uh, brotherhood uh, in in a more uh, fraternity way and uh, this uh, fighting ideas from the all these people will will, will vanish uh, this should be as far as i am concerned i feel that this basic knowledge should be included in every curriculum okay if it is not possible at least our people should take special interest in understanding the key concepts of buddhism properly dhamma properly how to observe you properly how to meditate how to understand and how to live uh, a, a, a life which is uh, you know not a blind life you should always you know uh, having a awareness about you self awareness a mindful way of life should be right. adopted by everybody and in that process you will automatically learn the contributions of these people forefathers what all struggles what all uh, efforts they have taken to popularize buddhism and the dhamma and understand it in a proper way not in a mystified see there are people can distort it in a different way like it is kind of a mystic mystic uh, uh, image 
for Buddhism. No, don't go for that. Buddhism has nothing mystic in that. It is just learning the nature, how la- how the nature is working inside you. Just learn that one and understand the key concepts and teach the uh, teach the uh, the future generations. So everybody should become uh, uh, a propagator of uh, Dhamma. That is what my message is. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Sorry, the voice is a bit of shaking. Uh, but thank you very much, thank sir, for joining for today on this, uh, this uh, topic uh, and, uh, and uh, giving elaborate information to our, all our viewers. We will invite you. Very, th- very thankful to you for uh, taking up such a wonderful, uh, very relevant uh, topic for today's discussion. And I'm very thankful to you. Thank you very much, and, sir. Uh, JP, JP, I'm a good yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank Friends, uh, friends, uh, friends, uh, friends uh, thank you very much for joining for today. Joining tomorrow, tomorrow again at 8 p.m. We will meet uh, on different topics on, topic, on, topic, on, topic, on, topic, on MNT Museum Network 5 session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.